Okay, so for this afternoon, I'm going to start with face and neck trauma. <clears throat> chapter 33, um, like I said lately, these chapters here at the beginning especially really tie in together a lot. Um, so I'm trying to, um, you know, combine all that as much as I can. So, yeah, and I kind of brought this up during our soft tissue, and just as a reminder, it's very important that we don't get distracted by the grotesque uh, injuries that we see. The soft tissue traumas are always very bloody, um, tend to be very distracting, and we want to make sure that's not distracting us for, from doing our job. Um, <clears throat> an example of how simple this could sound, it might seem a little ridiculous, is I had a former student who failed National Registry's trauma practical because um, when they entered, you know, started the scenario and BSI scene safe did the whole nine yards, um, they give the initial impression, patient's conscious, blah, blah, blah. Uh, or altered mental status and bleeding from a lack on the forehead and such. Well, the very first thing the student did was saying, oh, bleeding from the forehead, okay, I'm putting a, I'll put a dressing on that. Then went to airway breathing circulation. The problem is the bleeding in the forehead was not significant and it was stated to be. And the student then was treating a secondary injury, a non-significant, non-life-threatening injury prior to performing the primary assessment, airway breathing circulation. So it's, it might seem difficult to keep them straight, but exsanguinating hemorrhage, you stop. All other bleeding and soft tissue trauma waits until your primary survey is done. Here's your 14 facial bones. Um, it, I would say know your major bones here in your face. Uh, frontal, temporal, parietal, um, occipital, uh, mandible, maxillary, the zygomatics. Um, Question from Roswell. Say what? Question from Roswell. Uh-huh. Are the proctors for the practicals required to win... You say you're coming up to assess the scene. Are they required to say, say if a bleed, if a patient has a bleed, that it's uh, extinguishing uh, that word? Exsanguinating. Yes. They will say things like it's bright red blood, spurting blood, or it's um, bleeding very heavily, or something like that. Uh, there, there will be information that says this is a bad bleed. <clears throat> All right, so as far as the facial bones go, I would strongly encourage you to be familiar with these major facial bones. While you may not need to worry about the vulmar bone, the ethmoid bone, the um, lacrimal bones, and some of those, the ones that are on the parts of the face that we're going to see, the parts of the face and the head that we'll see, you know, your occipital, your frontal, your parietals, your temporals, maxilla, uh, zygomatic and mandible these are all bones that you're going to be able to say all right looks like there's a trauma or there's you know instability on the left maxilla or something like that so be familiar with those bones um, it's only 14 total and really probably only maybe eight that you really need to know so a little bit of creepiness for you here, showing cross section of the front of the face, ver vertical plane. Um, you can see the inside of the eyeballs. Uh, you see the fatty tissue and muscles around the eyeballs that cause it. This gives us the uh, good image of what the sinus cavities look like in our face and why they are so fragile and why they can lead to facial fractures. Because whenever you have um, bones that's hollow with those cavities inside you have a reduction in total strength excuse me also you can see how infection can uh get down inside those cavities and the uh, of the sinuses and all that and get stuck in there 
This is showing a blowout fracture of the orbit where there is a fracture that connects the eye socket all the way into the maxillary sinus. This um, can result in a lot of bleeding out of the nose, but also the fragment, the bone fragments can get stuck in the muscle. The um, Well, they're the um, muscles of the eyeball itself that were adjust and point. I'm blanking on the name of the muscle at the moment. Um, anyway, I'm blanking on the name of the muscle at the moment. But they, the bone fragments can get stuck in those muscles and cause that muscle to cramp, which would then deflect the eye in a specific direction. So if it's that uh, bottom muscle of the eye and it cramps, it might cause that eye to pull down or, or look down. And then when the patient moves their other eye, you'll notice that their eyes are not pointing in the same direction. Instead of them moving in together, you'll have one eye moving and the other stuck or fixed because they're because of that uh, because of the bone fragments in that muscle. So here you can see the muscles of the eye and around the eye that um, provide the movement of the eyeball, the optic nerve, all that kind of stuff. Um, injuries to the face and eyes and such are while they're not necessarily like specifically the eyes while they're not necessarily life-threatening they can be very significant or have a very significant impact on the patient's activities of daily living and their long-term outcomes so we do want to take these very seriously also what may end up appearing to be a fairly minor injury to the eye can appear very very significant or be very distressing to the patient because it is the eye and it is very uncomfortable and such like that so here's our different layers of the eye and we can see the uh the retina you see the vein there um the choroid that's where all of the nerve endings are well that's the body of the eye towards the back and then the retina lays over top of it the retina are actually the nerve endings but they lay over the choroid and then the sclera is the outer layer uh, that wraps around the eye cornea is only in the front and it's that protective surface of the eye and then uh you see the lens in between now there's a really interesting or something you really really do want to be familiar with here is the main portion of the eye is filled with what's called vitreous humor it's a very thick jelly-like humor and that's what give or fluid i said humor again sorry it's a thick jelly-like fluid that fills the eyeball and gives it its shape and rigidity um and then the and that's called the posterior chamber in in the major or the main portion of the eyeball now the anterior chamber which is behind in front of the iris but behind the cornea so between the iris and the cornea that is the anterior chamber and it is also filled with a fluid but it is a very thin watery fluid called the aqueous humor incidentally the aqueous humor is replaceable if the aqueous humor is lost through trauma it can uh, be replaced by the body. But if the vitreous humor, this jelly type, the gel stuff, the main portion of the eye is lost, it cannot be replaced. So that is probably one of the, uh, besides like irrigating eyes from acids and foreign objects, understanding that anterior chamber, aqueous humor, replaceable. Posterior chamber, vitreous humor, not replaceable. And if you lose that, it changes the, if you lose the vitreous humor, it changes the shape of the eyeball, which would result in the eye no longer being able to focus light properly on the retina. So it's a loss uh, or alteration of vision in that eye. Um, not necessarily complete blindness, but it could mean that they could never focus and see clearly. So it is really important that we protect the eyeballs from um, additional pressure and such during treatment if we have reason to believe that there's uh, lacerations or punctures to the eyeball itself. We, we want to make certain that we do everything possible to not lose that vitreous humor. Very loose dressings and things like that. All right, so the external ear, the, uh, the pina, and then you have the auditory canal. This is the part of the ear that's visible. Then you have the middle ear. This is behind the tympanic membrane, so between the tympanic membrane and the cochlea. Um, within the tympan uh, within the middle ear, you have what's uh, your three bones and your uh, three smallest bones in the body. Excuse me, the malleus incisus stapes. These convert the air. The, um, 
sound waves in the air that uh, vibrates the tympanic membrane like a drum converts it from sound waves in the air to sound waves in the water because our inner ear is full of uh, a fluid and that uh, fluid carries the vibrations to the nerve endings within the semicircular well not this, uh, within the cochlea itself now um the, an interesting thing about the uh middle ear is those three bones the sometimes called the stirrup anvil and hammer uh but malleus incus and stapes they are the only bones in our body that never grow they are the same uh, size at birth as they are at death at 90 years old they never grow because they are already perfectly sized and positioned to be able to make that uh, energy transfer from sound waves in the air to sound waves in the water uh, mechanically it's a very difficult um, thing to replicate from a mechanical sense so those are the smallest bones in the body and also the only bones in the body that do not grow or change in size hence if you were to cause damage sorry uh, this picture is better if you were to cause damage to those bones somehow it is um almost guaranteed to have hearing loss in that ear <laughs> so you can see this nice breakdown diagram you can see the cochlea there it's rolled up like a seashell like a conch shell and then you see the semicircular canals um, on the other side and we'll get into what those functions are later on you see the vestibular nerve and the uh, cochlear nerve sometimes referred to as the auditory nerve um, all right so um honestly there's really nothing that we can do for the middle ear uh the most common injuries that we are going to see is ruptures of the tympanic membrane there may be um lacerations avulsions bites and such to the outer ear the peanut and all that which you know we can put some gauze on it and dressings and that's about it because of its cartilaginous nature and decreased blood flow uh, oftentimes trauma to the outer ear to the peanut does not uh heal well and it ends up being like uh, lost tissues in an alteration of the ear shape but trauma to the middle ear in the inner ear there's not much we can do for it uh, as far as middle ear trauma i think our most common uh, example would be blast injuries or overpressure injuries bursting the eardrum or um, from a medical standpoint ear infections that swell to the point of rupturing the eardrum eardrum ruptures though they can be painful are generally not painful for very long and are very easily healed spontaneously anyone who's ever had chronic ear infections as a child and had tubes placed in the ear you are a living example of the ability of the tympanic membrane to heal when tubes are placed in the ears the tympanic membrane is incised and a small plastic straw is stuck uh, into the hole so that fluid builds up on the in middle ear can drain quickly to the outer ear and then as we age those um, the ear rejects the tympanic membrane rejects that plastic tube and it falls out and the tympanic me membrane heals up with uh, with no alteration of hearing all right now inner ear of course um, because our inner ear is responsible for our equilibrium, our recognition of position, it's kind of like the accelerometer. Uh, you're probably familiar with the accelerometer in your cell phone. It recognizes if it's up or down, sideways, you know, landscape portrait, however. Um, that Our inner ear, the semicircular canals, that is uh, the role they play for our body. They tell us if we're moving or not moving or something like that. So any trauma to that, uh, any injury around the ear can often result in vertigo or a abnormal sensation of movement uh, generally uh, manifests as dizziness, including nausea and vomiting. So those are kind of what we would look for uh, for ear injuries. Uh, I would remember that you have 32 teeth. Other than that, there's not a real, you, you don't need to memorize the names or the positions or how many of these are those. Um, but remember that there are 32 teeth, unless you live in Alabama, right? For you. Well, I guess 
you know, Georgia and Mississippi, we can both pick on Alabama, right? All right, so teeth, uh, interestingly enough, I wanted to point this out. There's very little we will normally do for teeth injuries. However, uh, take a look at this picture. You can see the tooth there, you see the cusps, the enamel on the outside, then the dentin on the middle, our uh, inner side, and then you have the periodontal membrane. That's where your nerves and blood vessels and stuff uh, go in there. I think it's important to remember that the teeth are alive. They are living tissue. While the enamel on the outside may be hard and um, as, you know singular in size and not change and grow, the inside of the tooth is alive. And so we want to take care of it um, and replace it and treat it if it's injured. Uh, but look at how the tooth is attached to the bone. It's a bunch of little uh, like ligaments that hold the tooth into the bone, and those ligaments can be regrown. So a tooth that's knocked loose or completely removed uh, through trauma can actually be placed back into the socket, into the gums, and um, will heal itself and grow back in and can uh, be restored completely. So. When you're dealing with a patient who's had a tooth avulsion, which is the loss of a tooth, do your best to find the tooth. Um, there is a quiz question that throws people for a loop, but if your response are uh, responding to some form of a um, altercation in which your patient complains of having lost a tooth, one of the locations to look for that tooth will be in the knuckles of the other person involved in the altercation to see if it's stuck in their, uh, hand when they punched them. Now, how do you punch somebody, get a tooth stuck in your knuckle and not know it and not bring it up right away? I don't really know, but it, you know, it is a consideration. Uh, oftentimes it's actually pr fairly easy. You irrigate the tooth, uh, rinse it out, rinse out the socket. If it's there, clean, you know, clean off any major contaminants or something like that. And then, um, without, without a lot of, um, messing and touching the, the roots of the tooth. It's not like you can't touch it, you, just, you don't wanna mess with it too much. Rinse it all off, rinse out the socket that the tooth came in, put it, it back into the um, socket in the correct orientation, make sure it's rotated right to you know, match the other tooth and so on and so forth. So it is a, um, once you place it back into the socket, take like a four by four, fold it up, put it on top of the tooth, tell them to bite down and hold it it will grow itself back into the um, gums and be healed. Now, when you get them to the hospital, they may use some stitches or something like that to hold it down, but really that's about all they're gonna do. And it's better to keep the tooth there in their gum than it is to like have to carry it to the hospital separate from their mouth. If the patient's altered, if you're worried about airway and things like that, you're not going to do this. But if they're conscious and that's their problem, a tooth got knocked out, well, you can actually replace it that way. Um, why do we just rinse it with saline, sterile saline or whatever, and not like try to put antiseptics on it and be sterile? Well, your mouth is not sterile and there is no way to get all the bacteria out of there and there's also no need. So um, as long as it's not grossly contaminated, you're gonna do that. If you were to use some kind of disinfectant like alcohol or betadine, it would probably cause more damage to the actual tissue of the tooth than benefits. So um, that's why we'll just place it back that way. We mentioned neck injuries earlier. We talked about lacerations to the jugular vein and things like that. Um, these are fairly easy to um, identify, but here's a good little breakdown of some of your muscle structures within the neck that we would be looking for. You see the internal and the external carotids. Notice how uh, the external and internal carotids uh, bifurcate uh, very high in the neck. So find your thyroid cartilage and then your hyoid bone, which is up above there and in between the two. So about this level of the neck, that's about where your carotids are going to bifurcate into two different, the inner, um, internal and external. So down here, low in the neck, the carotid is a singular um, uh, artery, sing singular vessel with the jugular running adjacent to it. So there's your jugular vein, internal and external jugulars. They split much lower and actually have two jugulars running up the inside of your neck. 
All right, so size up is pretty straightforward like we have been seeing so far, so nothing really special here. We are talking about head, neck, and chest uh, injuries, so therefore, or not head, neck, head, neck, and throat injuries, so airway is going to be a very con um, serious concern. We mentioned drainage from the ear canals or the nose earlier. We'll get into that more, but that indicates a skull fracture that is allowing the leakage of cerebral spinal fluid. Mm -hmm. Other indications of the possible skull fractures, periorbital ecchymosis or raccoon eyes, where you're um, getting contusions or darkening around the eyes, basically bruising around the eyes, or retroocular ecchymosis, battle signs, this is bruising behind the ears and the lower base of the neck, the back of the head, or the upper part of the neck. This is, in both of these indicate a basal skull fracture. And if we go back to our anatomy of the head, uh, no, they're not showing the underside of the skull here. All right, so, um, the raccoon eyes are generally going to be caused by a, um, went too far, I think. Yeah, so the raccoon eyes are generally going to be caused by the, a fracture of the cribriform plate. If you look at the side of the head, um, from the side view laterally like this, you have your eye sockets here. And you have your nose plane there. Your nasal passages go up inside your skull and then down your throat to your uh, trachea and all that. But your um, top of your nose right here, just below your eyes, there's a plate or a connection um, where your uh, olfactory nerve runs from your brain into the top of your sinuses and the top of your nasal passages. And that's what gives you your ability to sense and your sense of smell. Well, so this plate is right here, running back, and then we have the eye sockets here. Well, above and behind that is where your brain is. Uh, and actually, the cribriform plate probably runs more, is, is more up here, right above the eyes. The eyes are kind of anterior to it. And then your vulmar bone, which is the middle of your nose, runs up that direction. Well, that cribriform plate is perforated. There's a whole bunch of little holes in it. Um, let me see if I can pull a picture up for you. Um, here we go. Um, all right. Switch to browser. All right. So here you can see looking at the skull top of the skull here this ah there we go so notice here right at the nose um the eyes there's the brow top of the eyes right here um the orbit is right here sorry you can see the olfactory nerve and that's the cribriform plate and the nerve extending through it and then when we look here you can see that structure right there. The, this is one orbit, this is the other orbit, this is the cribriform plate in between. So that uh, perforation, here's a zoomed in structure on the actual skull, you can see all those perforations. That may, makes it very easy to rupture that or fracture that, and then because the brain sits right above it, cerebral spinal fluid or any contents of this uh, cranium would be able to leak through it. And so that's blood and such like that will cause the bruising around the orbits, creating the raccoon eyes. And then these uh, structures down here where you can see the carotids, jugulars, cranial nerves and such like that passing through. You see them more here as well. These are what make the base of the skull more uh, fragile resulting in trauma to that or fracturing that would create the raccoon eyes, the, um, the battle signs, which would, you know, then form here in the backs um, of the head right at the base of the back of the skull in the back of that. So that's just trying to give you a better perspective. Here you can see the cribriform plate again with the overall of the skull. Here's the anterior portion of the uh, low, lower base of the skull again where the basal skull fracture could become involved um so with that uh hopefully it gives you a better idea why or how a um 
skull fracture can happen, basal skull fractures and which kind and where they would be located, whether you had raccoon eyes or battle signs. So it is very con or it's of important or an easy way to determine uh, facial injuries is look for symmetry. Um, are you know the bones on the side of the face looking equal or do you see an, a major change by, by swelling or indention or something like that all right um yeah well i mentioned gaze earlier and how you can uh notice if one of their eyes is stuck in one direction and the other is pull is moving appropriately that can indicate an orbital fracture Anytime you're palpating the face, head, or neck, always use the flats of your hands. Never touch the face this way. Don't poke at it or the skull. If there's instability in the bones, you could cause further damage and discomfort with that. But just use the flat of your hands to see if there's any uh, movement or anything along those lines. All right, so. Exposed wounds, what are we talking about here? Make sure that the wound is visible, that you've removed any clothing, got the hair out of the way, tried to clean up as much bleeding as possible so that you can see where the actual injury is in order to effectively bandage it. Um, airway protection is paramount in all of these, obviously. So here we can see, we, cut, we were looking at these before, so we kind of already looked at what a hematoma is like. This is a far less dramatic hematoma than we saw in the last chapter. So, uh, all right. All right, maxillofacial fractures. Use the maxilla, remember, is the bone right here in the front of your face, the upper jaw and bottom, top of your mouth, all that kind of area. Anytime you have fractures there, you are, you, first of all, you're going to have uh, issues with your sinuses and breathing. Or, um, so they're going to have blood coming out of their nose and dripping down the back of their throat. But they may also have instability in their jaw and uh, possibly even loose teeth or something along those lines. All right, mandible fractures. Um, I had a patient, it was a car wreck, I'm trying to remember. Yeah, it was a car wreck and I was trying to intubate him and I couldn't get his tongue and such to move out of the way properly. Cause it turns out his mandible was fractured right here in the center of his chin. So he had, his uh, lower jaw was in two pieces. So whenever I would go to move the, um, insert the laryngoscope to, visualize his airway stuff would just kind of move everywhere instead of moving up out of the way as expected he kept pushing off to the side and such because of the uh, instability of his jaw it is possible for somebody to dislocate uh, their TMJ the joint between the bandible and um, temporal bones over here on the side of their head um, most of the time you're gonna hear people complain about oh it pops you know I can fear feel it popping or whatever. While they can dislocate it, it's very common for it to uh, reduce itself prior to our arrival. Uh, I've run that call several times. We're like, oh, they dislocated their jaw and you get there and they're talking. And it's like, well, dude, you wouldn't be talking if it was dislocated. So I think it reduced. I think you're gonna be okay, kind of a thing. Um, but it is possible. All right, uh, let's look at the Lafort fracture. So you have, these are your maxillary fractures where both maxilla and then sometimes even the zygomas are involved. So with the Lafort one, it's just one, two, three. Uh, so Lafort one, the fracture runs below the nose. So it's just the front part of the mouth. You don't, you'll see pain. There may be some instability here when you touch the upper jaw uh, on the upper lip, but there's not necessarily a lot of change in the face. Similarly with Lafort 2, this is where the fracture comes along the side of the uh, maxilla here between the maxilla and the zygoma and will often tra um, travel across the nasal bones here across the bridge of the nose. Again, not often a lot of change in the structure of the face, but you will feel that uh, instability in the movement of the face because the bones are still connected towards the posterior, the oral and nasal pharynxes. 
On the Lafort 3, however, this is where the entire lower portion of the face, all the way back to the jaw, has broken off. So the nasal bones, the zygomas here on the sides, at the side of the orbits, all the way back to the TMJ, that has fractured all the way through. Um, the pro patient probably still has their cribriform plate intact between the orbits, but basically through the sides of the orbits and all the way to the side, of, back to the ears, their whole upper portion of their face has been fractured loose and will actually sag down resulting in an elongation of their face they may um they may still be able to move their mouth and have some semblances of structure but it will create this elongation as it pulls down on their face stretching from their eyes so look for the size and symmetry of the eyes and see if they are the orbits they're supposed to be or are they starting to stretch out more like um ovals all right um so yeah anytime there's orbital fractures we already talked about the nasal discharge the blood filling up the sinuses and then running out the sinuses because of where the cribriform plate is you might have to worry about cerebral spinal fluid so whether we're talking cerebral spinal fluid coming from the nose or coming from the ears how are we going to identify that well the question was brought up apparently there was a question in the practice ex quizzes which i really would like to see if you see it again discussing the use of a glucometer for identifying the blood sugar differences between CSF and the blood. And we pointed out that you could check the discharge from the nose or the ear with the glucometer and then compare that to uh, their capillary blood glucose levels at like their finger stick. While that may be useful or you could use that, it's likely going to be irrelevant to your overall care for that patient. They still have facial trauma. They still have head trauma. They're likely going, to be, you're going to be taking them to a trauma center anyway due to whatever their mechanisms or other traumas are. Um, so it's not necessarily imperative that you identify that. Now, the other opter option for identifying CSF in the um, discharge from the nose and the mouth or the nose and the uh, ears is through the halo test. You've probably heard of this before. It has nothing to do with Bungie and Microsoft, but it is not. It is often not done properly in the field. So the idea here is that the surface tension of cerebral spinal fluid and that of blood are such that they don't mix. That the cerebral spinal fluid will move to the outside of a droplet of of the mixture, and then when it uh, so if it drops or it comes in contact with gauze, like clean white gauze, the blood will dry dark and the cerebral spinal fluid will dry yellow and be separated from each other, kind of a straw color to it. While this is true, you can't just like wipe the nose or wipe the ears with the gauze and get it to work because in that case, you've smeared everything together. In order to do the halo test, you need a free drop you know, a free falling droplet of discharge. And so you'd have to place the gauze under their nose and then they bleed onto it, drip onto it, and then you have to let it dry. And that might take some time. So that's one of those things that you get on scene, they're bleeding heavily from their nose or their ear. See if you can get a free drop of blood coming off their ear or out of their nose onto a piece of gauze and then set that aside. Um, during transport, you'll reevaluate it and see if it has dried um, to get that halo effect on the gauze. But you, you cannot um, wipe it or dab the side of their face or something like that to see if you can get cerebral spinal fluid that way. It's not, it's not going to be effective. All right, um, one thing I think is important to remember when it comes to facial fractures is anytime that you have um, enough force to the face to fracture bones, that force has been transferred through the cranium, through the skull, and likely to the back, to the neck, where the neck is connected, uh, or excuse me, the skull is connected to the spine, spinal column. And that can result in cervical um, injuries. So cervical spine injuries so anytime you're dealing with any type of major trauma to the face you want to treat for um, spinal mobilization precautions and immobilize their uh, cervical spine 
Evaluating the cranial nerve function is really not that big of a deal in the field. I wouldn't get too hung up on trying to memorize all your cranial nerves. Um, you can if you want, that's great. Don't have a problem with it, but uh, in, the, in the field when dealing with facial fractures and facial trauma, recognizing uh, abnormal function on one of your cranial nerves versus another is not going to be, is not going to heavily influence how we care and where we transport to. Um, re adequate cranial nerve function is more often evaluated in an effort to rule out injury and to ensure that everything is working fine, not necessarily as far as measuring the magnitude or um, uh, significance of the injury. So, uh, kind of talked about bleeding with and facial injuries before maintaining the airway with that. So, not going to spend as much time on this. These are patients when you have RSI capabilities. These are the patients who really do need it um, because the. ET tube is the only way to secure the airway and guarantee that you're not going to have uh, blood leaking around the OPA or around the, the eye gel or something like that and uh, creating aspiration and such. So um, they really do need an ET tube if at all possible, though that normally is going to require uh, RSI to accomplish. Of course, uh, foreign bodies in the throat, anything stuck down in there, you're going to try to fish it out with your um, uh, McGill forceps or something along those lines. I think we know how to handle bleeding, soft tissue trauma. I think we're good there. Um, these, so I don't want to say that the book is wrong, and I'm not trying to say that at all, because if you suction the airway, if you suction the face, the mouth too long, you can actually start sucking all the air out of their lungs and collapsing their lungs, and that's definitely not helping anybody. But if you're suctioning, and because of the quantity of bleeding or vomit or whatever it happens to be in their mouth, you've suctioned for 15 seconds and it's still full of blood, well, then you're not sucking air out of the lungs and you're not creating a problem. If you were sucking small quantities of blood out of the mouth for more than 15 seconds then you're, and you're pulling in a lot of air, well, that definitely is a concern. But if their mouth is full and pouring out of blood, and I mean, I had one not long ago, the guy offed himself under the chin with a nine millimeter and he had blood, he wasn't dead when we got there yet. He Well, he was, he just didn't know it. Um, or his his heart and lungs didn't know it, his brain sure did. Anyway, the blood was pouring into his mouth faster than I could s suction it out. So I'm, su I'm suctioning the blood out of his mouth and it's still running out from under his uh, chin and out the corners of his mouth because that just it was bleeding that fast and that heavily. Um, so there is... You, you have to clear the airway. If you're just sucking air, don't do that for more than 15 seconds because you're going to collapse the lungs. But otherwise, clear the airway and suction until the airway is clear. What happens if you hook up two suction devices at the same time? Do you, in theory, You want to think about whether or not those suction uh, catheters or the, the yonkers or whatever, and that's a good idea, but uh, are they suctioning blood or are they pulling air? You know, it, are they completely submerged in liquid and just pulling in liquid or are they pulling in a lot of air? If they are pulling air, you don't want to run them that long. You won't even run them for 15 seconds. You, you want to run them for less than 10, you know, maybe five seconds because you're going to pull a lot of air out of the lungs. And you can tell uh, if you're pulling air versus pulling blood Does that or pulling liquid. Does that make sense? All right, why are we not applying a cold compress to the eyeball? You don't want to put pressure on the eyeball. Yep, you don't want to put added pressure up on the eyeball that could cause it to leak out its humor, the vitreous or the aqueous humor, but also you don't, um, the eye is very 
uh, thermal or temperature sensitive structure. It doesn't produce a lot of ATP, and so it doesn't produce a lot of heat in there. So uh, if you were to chill it too much with a cold compress, you could uh, you could cause a thermal damage, you know, cold injury dam um, to the eyeball. So. The next few slides uh, in this section are going to have some very grotesque pictures of be they ears, eyes, mouth, stuff like that. Here we can see lacerations of the eyelid, the lower eyelid, but also a laceration of the eyeball itself. Now looking at that picture, do you know if that is vitreous humor or aqueous humor? What you guys think over there? It's probably vitreous because it's keeping its shape. It suggests that it's jelly. That is a very good observation. Because it is keeping its shape, it is very possibly vitreous, it, though it could be aqueous with a, just a good surface tension or maybe still underneath the cornea and not completely relieved. I don't know. The point is, we don't know, so let's not put any pressure on that eye. Don't put heavy compression uh, bandages on there or something like that. You want to protect that eye. Bryce, would you even try to check pupil dilation at that point, or would you just leave it completely alone? Uh, at this point, it would probably be irrelevant um, and unnecessary, um, simply because what's the what is the pupil dilation going to tell me that I don't already know? I know their eye is injured. Um, if the other eye has pupillary dilation, well, then maybe that's you know I can check that, but. Um, I'll probably use some other method to identify whether uh, what their mental status is and their neurologic status. But no, I'm not going to look for pupil. I'm not going to look specifically for pupil dilation with that injury. However, I might still be using a light on their eye trying to get a better look at it. Um, so, all right, foreign objects in the eye, we can see uh, both of these eyes have, you know, the top one looks like it's got a chunk of metal or something in there. Maybe that's dirt or, I mean, a piece of grass or wood chip or something. And then the bottom one is showing some a lot of the irritation that tends to come after a um, foreign body has been removed. Now, a lot of times if we irrigate their eye and they get that foreign object out, they'll still have the sensation of the object in their eye. And uh, that's because of the lacerations or the abrasions that that object caused while it was um, under their eyelid and in their eye. If you can remove it with a um, irrigation, it means it was simply on the surface of the eye. If it does not remove with irrigation, um, and you can use like a 10 cc syringe, break the um, break it loose so it's not going to squirt them under high pressure. But you can try to irrigate it with that, or you can use the IV bag with a drip set as a um, you know kind of a hose or something. If it can relieve or remove with that irrigation, great, perfect. You have fixed your problem. Well, at least created a much better situation for the patient. But if it doesn't remove immediately, do not try to remove it with tweezers or a, a Q-tip or cotton ball or gauze uh, pad or something because it's likely embedded into the eyeball itself, into the, orb the globe, and you don't want to cause further damage to the tissue by possibly pushing it in deeper. Or if it is penetrating all the way into the center, in interior chamber of the globe. If you were to remove it, it could then leak the humors more easily. So don't try to remove things that aren't um, wash, rinsing out with, through irrigation. So here we have a significant amount of swelling and ecchymosis. This is, uh, I would consider this probably a hematoma as well as swelling up under that eyeball. Um, say this patient is probably going to say they can't see because their eye is swollen shut. Um, but we can encourage them and comfort them in knowing, well, your eyelid is swollen heavily and that's why you can't see because it's swollen closed. Um, this does not mean that you are blind in that eye. Hyphema. This is a term we use to refer to the blood that is in the anterior chamber of the eye. So this is blood replacing aqueous humor in front of the lens, you know, in front of the pupil. And as you can see, it creates its own little level in that anterior chamber and can occlude the pupil. 
Uh, so um, just generally going to be caused by blunt trauma or high pressure trauma to the eye. Retinal detachments, nothing we can do for it, um, but uh, this is going to be uh, much, well, it's, these are very difficult for the patient to heal from and often result in loss of vision, peripheral vision, floaters, just, um, and things like that. So here's burns to the eyes. Uh, they could be thermal or, um, which I believe the one looking at the, the one on the right uh, I believe that is a thermal burn, where the one on the left is a chemical burn. Um, but they could both be chemical burns. I'm, I'm not positive. If it's a chemical substance of some sort, acid or alkali, acid or base, you need to flush it heavily. Acids, five minutes. Alkali is 20 minutes minimum uh, to get that chemical out of the tissue. Okay, so those were both chemical burns. My bad. These are your thermal burns. If a person has thermal burns to their eye, what do you think the priority of care is? Savannah, maybe y'all can answer this one. If a patient presents with thermal burns to the eye and around the eye like this, what is your priority of care? Don't overthink it. If you're talking to me, I can't hear you at all. I got nothing. Maybe Conyers has an opinion. Maybe their microphone works. Is it stopping the burning process? Well, you do want to stop the burning process, but that's not your biggest priority. Mean, and it's very important, yes, but it, I wouldn't say it's your primary concern. If a patient has thermal burns to and around their eye, that is directly adjacent to their mouth and nose. This is indicating a very high risk of airway burns. And those airway burns are going to take precedent over your um, eye burns or other facial burns. So. Think about how did they get thermal burns to their eye and what uh, what is the chances they have um, concurrent airway burns because the airway burns are really where you need to focus. Okay, then you have your um, burns to the retina these are often not uh, very visible from the outside uh, we're not going to recognize them in the field we're just going to simply um, uh, recognize the likelihood of them another thing yeah it's not mentioned here would be a person who was welding or in the presence of somebody welding without having proper eye protection and the welding arc uh, creating a similar type uh, burn to their retina um, it seems like every time there's a eclipse, you're going to run some teenage boy somewhere who thought it was a great idea to look at the eclipse without sunglasses. And once it ended, got retinal burns in his eye because, you know, he was looking at the sun without sunglasses. All right. Um, yeah. Hopefully we know how to ask these questions, you know, nothing really unique about um, eye injuries. You would want to talk about or ask about peripheral vision and visual field floaters and things like that. All right. Uh, double vision is a great indicator of an orbital fracture because when the two eyeballs are not focused on the same point, they will often see two of everything. Uh, so uh, it's not necessarily an issue, uh, not often an issue with the brain itself indicating a brain injury as much as it's indicating a structural injury around the orbit and around um, or into the muscles that move the eyeball. Kind of already covered all of these different findings. Um, so.
Yep, yep, covered that. All right, so if the eyeball for somehow is displaced out of the socket, do not attempt to manipulate it or reposition it. Make certain that you irrigate it uh, adequately and then cover it with a gentle, you know, um, loose dressing. You don't want to put any pressure on it or anything. And it would be a good idea to keep that um, eye, the orbit, um, excuse me, the globe, uh, moist and irrigated so that it doesn't dry out when it's outside of the body um, You can stabilize uh, a impaled object like this um, It used to be taught very commonly that if a patient had an injury to one eye You had to bandage both eyes in order to so that they, if they moved the left eye with the right eye wouldn't be moving underneath the bandage it's actually been determined that our body can recognize when one eye is closed and uh, stop sending nerve control to that eye. And so if there's an injury or whatever, it's very unlikely that the movement of the uncovered eye or the unaffected eye will have a negative impact um, if they're subconsciously moving it. And in fact, if you can leave the uninjured eye open, it generally calms the patient because it reassures that they can see, they do know what's going on around them, and makes them much more comfortable um, overall. Yeah, there's nothing we're going to do to really tr to truly heal these burns. So a uh, tool compress, not an ice pack, but a cool compress, um, may be soothing but we're not really going to fix a retina ah the morgan lens okay so the morgan lens is a really cool device that we are supposed to be able to have here in the state of georgia back in 2014 when they did the major paramedic update they added the morgan lens to scope of practice and it was required to learn how to use it but i have yet to find a department that actually stocks them on their trucks um, it is a very effective way to create irrigation in the eye and so i'm going to show you how to do that here uh, so bear with me but i do think that the state of georgia feels like we need to be familiar with its use and function it is a soft rubber um, a lot of people freak out when they see it and how does that not hurt or anything it's a soft rubber very similar to a contact lens and once it, the irrigation starts flowing um, it apparently i've not had it done is very um, soothing now the alternative method is to take the IV drip set and hold it right over their eye while you try to uh, run fluids through their eye and hold their eyelids open. People do not like that. That is very unpleasant. Another option if you're trying to irrigate both eyes is to put a nasal cannula over the bridge of their nose with one of with each of the ports running down the side or on either side of the nose and then they're irrigating the eye but again you have to hold the eye open in order to be able to continually irrigate it again not very comfortable for your patients so um yeah there's only one option here that I think is worth attempting. Um, this is this is really hilarious to me because the eye wash station that's being shown in the top right corner with the woman holding her own eye open, that is supposed to be mounted the other direction. That is mounted upside down. Those eye cups are supposed to be pointing up. It, that puddles water up into small fountains and you lower your eyes into those fountains as they rinse and then it falls away from you. You, you don't try to like put your head underneath the fountain like that. That uh, eye wash station is mounted upside down. Um, I would not attempt to use a saline bottle like that. You're just, <coughs> excuse me, you're asking to dump a whole lot of water too quickly and lose control of your flow. Use the saline bag and a drip set to irrigate the eye. Um, we're not the CIA, so we're not going to be doing waterboarding and putting the patient's face directly into a um, pan of water like this. Um, this just would not be an effective way to irrigate their eye because then anything in their face or, or in their eye is now being spread across their face and their face is underwater. So I really would not recommend that method at all. Not unless you work for the CIA.
Mostly RED have discussed the out injuries to the outer ear, foreign bodies in the ear. Sometimes kids stick toys, um, candy, stuff like that down in their ear. And um, most of the time those are not uh, emergency situations and they should be referred to an ENT or a pediatrician for removing it. This is not necessarily something you need to go to the ER for unless it's a penetration, like, you know, a an ob a pencil or something like that in their ear. I kind of already talked about ruptured eardrums already, um, so not much more we need to get too concerned about. Um, so here you can see some pretty significant lacerations to the ear. Here's a good way you can see how they're um, bandaging this gentleman's ear, uh, rolling and uh, folding the gauze around his chin and the back of his head in order to apply pressure and maintain that pressure. Um, on the external ear. Uh, I didn't realize they had gotten a picture of the high priest's servant uh, from the Garden of Gethsemane. So yeah, if partially evolves, try to line it back up as much as you can. If uh, completely wrap it in gauze and moisten it, keep it cool but not cold. We already talked about how to identify CSF. Um, all right, so this is getting into injuries of the mouth. So we've kind of come through ear injuries a fair amount. So let's pause, take a quick break, and then we'll get back to it. All right, well, this guy doesn't look like he's having a great day. Looks like he bit through his lip and he's got some uh, dislocated teeth. Uh, it's important to remember that when you're dealing with oral and facial trauma, but specifically around the mouth and all, it's a heavy vascular place. So soft tissue trauma to this area is, will, will bleed heavily and seem very significant. Also, the fact that the blood is being mixed with the saliva, which is thinning it and complicating uh, cl the clotting process, will make it appear like there was a lot more blood than there really was. It is important to keep their airway open and clear and not allow them to or prevent them from swallowing as much blood as possible because blood will make them nauseous. All right, um, so you got to consider what was the cause of the trauma. If the patient has significant facial trauma, like I mentioned before, you need to protect their cervical spine. But occasionally the trauma is more isolated and uh, not necessarily involving as much force. So you're, in order to control the bleeding, it might be best to have them sitting up, leaning forward over a basin or something like that. Now, when I do that, I like to put some gauze or some paper towels or something in the bottom of the basin to help absorb the liquid so it's not sloshing around during transport or something like that. But, uh, you know, this also works for nasal trauma and all that, but have them, you know, lean forward and continue to spit uh, any of the blood out. You can also give them the Yonker suction, show them how to use it, and then they can suction it out when they feel bleeding in their mouth. That especially works when the patient's lying supine and is fully conscious. That way they don't um, swallow it. Um, I've already mentioned how to... Uh, Replace the teeth if they've been knocked out. Don't forget to look down in the airway and make sure that they haven't swallowed or inhaled the tooth during the um, while they were unconscious. Um, if they have a gag reflex and all that kind of stuff, it's a less likely that there's that they've been um, inhaled it or that they've aspirated or choking on them. So if they have a gag, um, so you probably don't need to get too hung up on that point if they. They don't want the laryngoscope going down their throat. They probably got the tooth out of their way. All right. Um, by removing the fractured fragments, what they're talking about is if there's pieces of teeth floating around in their mouth, remove that. I'm not suggesting or encouraging you in any way to... Uh, take the root of the tooth that's broken off out of their mouth or extracted or anything like that. That that's please don't misunderstand that.
All right, we already mentioned how to handle an evolved tooth. So um, what you're showing here with the one, two, and three is kind of the severity of anterior neck injuries and the types of vessels that the patient is going to be at risk at. And this is specifically for lacerations and penetrations. Um, in that uh, stage two or that area two, you're very uh, much at risk, on, especially on the lateral sides, of uh, great vessel injury. Um, when you get down there into the area one or zone one, you're uh, actually at pretty good risk of a pneumothorax, uh, depending on the angle of the penetration or laceration. So, um, yeah. Airway management can be very difficult in these patients, especially if you've crushed an airway, the trachea, or something along those lines. We already mentioned air embolisms earlier. Um, this would be an excellent example of where you have penetrating trauma that could be involved in the airway, but also may be resulting in air embolisms. Also, if this is into the jugular or even the carotid, this could be occluding that vessel and preventing the severe bleeding or the exsanguinating bleeding. So this is one of those you want to be very careful with on trying to decide to remove it. Always err on the side of leave it. And no, don't remove that unless absolutely necessary. Um, I've heard of these where they were inserted like this and they were right against the carotid and they bounced every time the carotid uh, pulse was felt. Um, if it's not in the airway, insert some other form of airway or control her airway some other way. You can control her airway with her head turned to the side. It's not as easy for sure, but it may be necessary. Um, if this, if you're able to determine that this is actually through the trachea, well then maybe you do need to remove it and uh, insert your ET tube through that hole. If you're going to do something like that, I would encourage you to insert your larynx, um, a bougie, maybe even like a pediatric bougie, into the trachea first. So if you can identify, look, the knife is in the trachea. Um, I'm going to slide the bougie down next to it, get it into the trachea, and now I've established, you know, now I've confirmed that my bougie is in the trachea. I remove the knife, I place the um, ET or slide the ET tube down along uh, the bougie into the trachea, and we've established an airway. So that that's a option. Uh, is it a little unconventional? Not not exactly. I mean, but it, it might seem so, but it is a perfectly appropriate option. Yep, yep, yep. I mean, soft tissue injury anywhere. Yep. Ah, this was the picture I was talking about earlier. This is a very effective way to control bleeding on the lateral side of the neck, possibly even the posterior neck, not necessarily the anterior, but it could work. Um, but you, there's a lot of the, the neck that can be controlled this way. Notice how they're crisscrossing it over the top of her shoulder and then wrapping it under the armpit to go back up across the top and around the other side of the neck. This will leave the opposite side, you know, so if the gauze is going this way, it leaves this portion of the neck with the great vessels, the um, carotids and jugular on the opposite side completely unaffected. And un, uh, so the patient has blood flow in and out of her brain through the opposite sides, carotid and jugular, and you're applying direct pressure to the injured side, which may result in a, a decreased blood flow through those uh, great vessels. But I mean, that's kind of the point. That's what you're trying to do is control that bleeding. So that can be an effective way to do it. Is this going to work and be appropriate in very rarely and very few situations? Are you going to have a patient with that kind of a neck wound needing to have airway or um, bleeding control and being able to sit or cooperate in some way with you to uh, wrap it and bandage it like this? Now, remember, right here where our carotids are is where our vagus nerve is. And what do we do with the vagus nerve? Alejandro, you're hiding. What do we do with the vagus nerve?
Do it. Do it. Somebody. GTR, you guys are being quiet today. What do you do with the Vegas nerve? Yeah. And what happens when you massage it? They go bradycardic. Yeah. So if you're putting pressure on the side of their neck like that, you could stimulate that vagus nerve and result in a reflex bradycardia. So could you treat that with uh, atropine? Yes, that would work. Um, and, but I wouldn't necessarily say loosen the bandage because you're putting it on there for bleeding control for a purpose, right? So, uh, but that is an option that you would have available. The atropine that is. All right, this is talking about the airway, ET tubes into the trachea. I kind of pointed that out already. Um, what are methods are we? What methods are we going to use to confirm our uh, placement if we try to attempt percutaneous airway? You know, surgical airways, inserting the ET tube through the lacer an existing laceration, something like that. How will we confirm our airway? If we insert a needle airway, like a needle crike or a surgical crike or an ET tube through a laceration into the trachea, what are methods that we will use to confirm our airway placement? What type of entitled CO2 detection? Waveform is very important. So waveform, lung sounds, the present or lack of subcutaneous emphysema or tissue swelling in the area, um, saturation, O2 sats, things like that. It is really, really important that we're careful to ensure that we've got proper placement of the ET2 because it's very easy to miss the trachea and insert the tube into the tissue of the neck and then you're going to result with sub-Q emphysema. Uh, good question. Um, you want to, you'll be able to look, you say, okay, so the hole is right here. We've placed it right there. Um, you know that it's a roughly right here uh, at the sternal notch is where the carina is, where it goes to the left and right main stem bronchi. So you're thinking maybe only a couple of inches, but gauge that based on your um, location of insertion site. You may only need to put just uh, just enough to get the cuff inside the trachea. Uh, so it's gonna it's not like in the mouth where you can say this is a set depth that we know we have to go to. Uh, you want to assume that the carina is at the sternal notch or the manubrium, and then not insert the tip of the ET tube past that point. Um, however, it would still be better to have it too deep into the right main stem and have a good airway than to not have it deep enough and air being uh, leaked back out. One benefit of using the bougie is the inside of the trachea has those cartilage rings and when you rub the tip of the bougie along the side of the trachea wall, it will feel, you'll have that tactile um, stimulation. You'll, you'll feel the uh, bumping or the rubbing, the vibrations of some sort. And so you'll know that you're in the trachea versus uh, into some other form of tissue. All right, so spinal trauma, sprains and strains of uh, spinal muscles. Um, this is much more common um, in the neck. Where people will sh uh, pull a muscle or strain something in their neck. Doesn't happen near as much down in the uh, spinal column, in the lumbar and thoracic region, although it can. But um, so sprains, stretching or tearing a ligament, strains, stretching or tearing a muscle. <laughs> 
we will not be able to identify if this is nerves involved, if this is muscle, if this is tendon, or if this is bone. So we're going to treat them all about the same. We're going to um, secure them, um, immobilize them, and transport them uh, for evaluation. Now, I've had several patients over the years that were uh, that had fractured vertebrae to one degree or another, but the most a uh, significant fracture was several vertebrae in the lumbar were shattered um, in multiple places, uh, significant instability of the lower lumbar, and the patient refused beyond, a sh beyond with no question, absolutely under no circumstance would he be put on a long backboard. It was the result of a car accident, lateral impact and such like that. Um, and he absolutely flat refused to be put on a long backboard. Um, he would not tolerate the pain and the discomfort. So the crews that I was with uh, figured out a way to immobilize him on the stretcher with the back of the stretcher sitting almost straight up and uh, moved him more or less like a, with a KED type method out of the car onto the stretcher secured him uh, tightly to the stretcher and transported that way and, and for years I would say that was the worst spinal cord injury or spinal column injury I'd ever seen and the patient would not be put on a backboard and you know they the we had him sign refusals and all that kind of stuff in order to uh, cover things legally but it, sometimes that happens All right, um, now for, I, I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm saying. It is very, very important that we maintain control of the C-spine and um, of anywhere on their spinal cord and prevent spinal motion. But the incidence of secondary trauma, so patient has trauma, there's damage to the spinal column, and then we move them resulting in severed nerves and paralysis, the chances of that happening are incredibly low. It could be pointed out that in the US military, they use C collars quite frequently, but they almost never use backboards um, for their injured patients that, you know, penetrating trauma to the torso or even um, explosions and um, th patients who've been thrown and things like that. Very rarely will they use a backboard. Frequently they use C collars, but um, they do. there are backboards, there are times and places where they're used. Most of the time they just put them on the flat stretchers. This is because their studies and research have shown that the likelihood of a secondary trauma happening is significantly lower and less of a concern comparatively to getting that patient to definitive care quickly. Now, generally speaking, when a soldier or somebody in the military is injured and needs to be pulled out on a stretcher, they're, they're not in a uh, friendly environment and so there is a lot of uh, need to get out of that area as quickly as possible we have a different scenario generally people are not shooting at us when we're trying to package somebody onto a backboard and so we can take the extra time if necessary to ensure that they um, are protected as much as possible but if the patient has a life threat, airway, breathing, circulation, something like that, as a not being controlled well, those take priority and you will sacrifice the spine for the priority of getting to the hospital quickly, maintaining that airway through what, a head tilt if necessary or whatever it happens to be, you sacrifice the spine uh, for those treatments. All right, so section on injury prevention, of course, we'd be remiss if we were to talk about how to pre uh, take, treat head, face, and neck trauma and never considered injury prevention. So encourage people to do these things um, in order to prevent injuries like this in the future. Um, we are seeing far more survivable injuries from car accidents because of the engineering changes in the vehicles, the um, energy absorption capacity of the vehicle and their um, 
preventing the transfer of energy to the patient and, or to the occupants. So people are walking away from wrecks that look completely devastating. Um, you would think that no one could live with, I mean, I ran a call one time where the car split straight in two. Um, it was uh, in a high speed wreck on a rural um, back road, not even a highway, um, lost control, flipped it over uh, an embankment back onto the roadway and split the car in half front and back. And he ended up sitting in the chair in the middle of the roadway, sitting in the driver's seat in the middle of the roadway with the car separated from him. Um, no injury. No injuries whatsoever. Uh, to, oh, well, no, he did have some minor abrasions on his forehead or something like that. But v comparatively nothing. So because of that, a lot of people will not have injuries or have very minor injuries and yet be freaking out because it looks like their car is about to explode or that it had already exploded into a thousand pieces. And so a lot of our job here is to then reassure them that, hey, they're okay. You wore your seatbelt. Your airbags went off. They did their job. Your car protected you. You're going to be okay. This is really scary but right now you're okay. And uh, reassure them. Oftentimes, if you can call, reassure them that way, they will calm down quickly and realize, oh, I'm not actually injured. You know, I might be sore, but you know, everything is okay. So that is um, head, neck, and spine.